Welcome back. We're now going to move on and discuss some of the outpouchings that I described to you in the beginning of this section as to how the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, evolved from just a thin tube to certain enlargements like the mouth and then the stomach, and then also had little side channels pooch out from the sides of the places along the way and develop into whole new organs with direct connections to the GI tract. These include the pancreas, the liver, and what we call the biliary tree, which are some of the attachments of the liver. Let's first get a look again at the anatomy. In this slide, we have a sagittal section. If you remember, that's a cut that goes right down the middle of the body. And this patient is looking at us with the right side removed. The patient is facing in this direction. We're looking toward the left side. And we're seeing the abdominal cavity. I want to go over this slide one more time with the model to again show you the evolution of the coverings of the abdominal cavity and some of the compartments in terms you'll hear me use a lot. This is called the peritoneal cavity and the lining is called peritoneum just as there was the pleura and the pericardium and the same thing happened. That big balloon got blown up but this time in a much much more complicated way because we have so many organs in the single cavity. What we have is the parietal peritoneum lining all the way down the abdomen and into the pelvis and then coming up the back again and all under the diaphragm. Almost all the organs that are in the body in the peritoneal cavity are covered in the visceral peritoneum. So the lining of the surface of the liver, the stomach here seen cut on end, uh, the intestines, the colon, and all the blood vessels that are going to those organs are covered in visceral peritoneum. Again, it's adherent, you can't peel it off, and the parietal peritoneum is thicker and more tough, and it's only on the outside. Now we have a designation called intraperitoneal and extraperitoneal organs, those that are inside and those we consider outside. Sometimes we call them retroperitoneal, because they're really in the back, behind the peritoneum. And those organs that are significant include the pancreas, which is behind the peritoneum covering the back wall, and also the kidneys, which are not shown here. Also, the middle portion of the duodenum is considered extraperitoneal, as is the rectum. The reason this is important is because diseases that affect them are different from the diseases that affect the intraperitoneal organs. So if we look at this model again, you can see how the liver would be covered with peritoneum, but also the gallbladder would get caught up in that covering. Here's a picture of the gallbladder, and when the visceral peritoneum comes to this edge of the gallbladder, it doesn't go behind it, it actually goes right over it. We're gonna get to see that live on a movie of a removal of a gallbladder. Also, the stomach would be covered with peritoneum, and yet the duodenum, way in the back, will dive behind the peritoneum and be extra or retroperitoneal until it comes out again right here and joins the intestine. It's a C-shaped organ. It has a first, second, third, and fourth portion that we described, and it's all back behind the peritoneum, as is the pancreas. We'll uh, leave these here and... So this slide, again, reviews that position of the peritoneal coverings, and I'll come back to that. Let's first look at the pancreas, an organ we haven't mentioned too much so far, but which is a very, very important organ in several organ systems. The pancreas gets its name from the words pan, which means all, and kreos, which means flesh. It got that name because it is supposed to dissolve all flesh. It's a very powerful digestive organ. It has lots of built-in protection, so it won't dissolve itself. If you look at the first slide, it is back here. It's nestled in the loop of the duodenum that I showed you. 
goes upward and back. It is, as I said, retroperitoneal, and it's in the very back of the upper to mid abdomen. It's about 12 inches long. It tapers from right to left, and the head, the position of the head of the pancreas lying in the crook of the duodenum, very, very important clinically, and we'll talk about that as we move along. The uh, body of the pancreas is about in the middle of the abdomen, and then it sweeps up, and although you don't see it in this slide, it tucks right into the spleen, which lies here. So it's going very far toward the back. The spleen is actually much more to the back than the slide. And as it wraps around the spinal column, it actually heads back and almost touches the spleen. Now the pancreas is, um, also has another very important relationship. It lies just under, at this point, just under the back wall of the stomach. So the posterior or back wall of the stomach lies right against the anterior surface of the pancreas. And this can be very important. For example, there are cysts and what are called pseudocysts of the pancreas that bulge into the stomach. Since it's very hard for us to get to this portion, for example, with the stomach here, the dissection would be very dangerous for us to get to the cyst and drain it. What we actually do surgically is open the front of the stomach and then go through the back wall to drain the cyst into the stomach, sew them together, close up the front wall, and actually it's a rather simple operation as opposed to a non-anatomical operation where we had to take down a lot of structures, do a possibly a lot of damage to deal with that. These relationships are very, very important to the emerging medical student and to surgeons who deal with diseases in that area. Now, the pancreas is also very adherent to the first portion and second portion of the duodenum, which is right in this C curve. In fact, it's called the C loop of the duodenum. This is important because duodenal ulcers, which lie against the top of the pancreas in most cases, can actually penetrate back into the pancreas and cause inflammation and infection in the pancreas. And this, too, can be a very serious disease. I have seen young, healthy adults come into a hospital and be dead within 14 hours from severe pancreatitis, despite all good medical treatment. So area that's full of very complicated anatomy. The blood supply to the pancreas, it's very richly supplied with blood, as you can see. And as we've learned in the whole GI tract, here is the gastroduodenal artery coming down and giving off what's called the superior upper pancreatico duodenal artery because it gives branches to both. And then you see branches dropping off all the way from the splenic arteries and some coming from another artery way down here, the superior mesenteric artery, giving supplies to the pancreas. Very, very well supplied with blood. Um, this is important in its survival also important in surgical situations, but also can present a problem because the pancreas can be very, very difficult to operate on when necessary because of this tremendous blood supply. There are a lot of vessels that have to be clamped and cut before the pancreas uh, can be uh, removed or partially removed. There's a duct system in the pancreas, and the duct system is one that also has some significant ramifications. Let's look here. This is schematic and forget about all the writing on this slide and just look at the pancreas nestled in here. Actually, in this picture, this duct is not correctly placed. It should be behind the duodenum. Here's the emptying of the stomach, the last portion of the antrum. Pylorus would be right about here and then this is duodenum. The, pan the head of the pancreas is nestled in here. The part we call the head comprises a, really more than 50% of all the mass of the pancreas. And we have a duct coming down from the liver, carrying bile into the intestine and moving it through a hole here, which is called the ampulla of vata. An ampulla is an, a widening in a duct. There's also 
the duct of Wiersung. All the doctors got their names attached, which drains most of the pancreas and joins with this channel from the liver just before it ducts into the duodenum. Again, incidentally, this one is actually behind the duodenum. And sometimes there's an accessory duct here called the duct of Santorini, which goes in separately. Not of very great significance. However, what is of great significance is this common channel. Because these two ducts enter together, you can have a stone come down from the gallbladder or the liver and find its way to here and be unable to get through this ampular of water and back up bile into the pancreas, which is very irritating and can light off a pancreatitis, this very serious disease. So patients with gallstones can actually get a secondary pancreatitis, much more serious than just having gallstones, and they can become very sick because of this common channel. Now there's a little sphincter here called the sphincter of Odi, which can open and close, and in patients who have chronic problems with this uh, dis disorder, if they can't get rid of the stones, we can open that sphincter and make it a much bigger channel for the stones to drop in, get into the intestinal tract, and then pass on so they won't have to uh, be a problem with pancreatitis. Let's look at the microscopic anatomy for a moment, or at least talk about the microscopic anatomy. The pancreas has two functions, and the function that's probably most critical to survival has nothing to do with digestion. It is both an exocrine and endocrine organ. I have to give you some definitions here before we move ahead. You've already heard about endocrine organs. Endocrine means that the hormone messenger that's secreted by that gland goes endo, it goes into the bloodstream, is circulated to the target organ. Exocrine organs take their substance and pour them directly into the lumen of another organ. So the pancreatic juices in this case would go, digestive juices would go directly down the ducts and into the duodenum. That's an exocrine uh, organ. Then there's something else called apocrine, which we'll come across later, and that's when part of the organ itself gets secreted. Sweat glands are apocrine organs. Not only is um, sweat, which is water and salt, secreted out onto the skin, but cells from the gland itself come out too in kind of a thick mixture, and so part of the gland is lost. Actually, the breast is considered a modified sweat gland, an apocrine organ, so that milk and some cells come out as well. We're going to talk about apocrine glands later, and we're going to talk about the endocrine system in its own. The pancreas's endocrine system secretes insulin, and it secretes glucagon, and these are two um, signal chemicals that elevate and lower blood sugar. Now, the exocrine pancreas that we're interested at this point comprises 99% of all the pancreatic tissue. I mean, this is the big portion of the pancreas, and the volume of that is, is just gigantic compared to the amount of small molecules put out in the remaining 1% by the endocrine pancreas. It mainly secretes digestive juices into the duct system, which then move down into the duodenum. And there it mixes um, with the rest of the juices and the chyme to further digestion. The secretory cells are arranged in what are called asini, little nests that go around small ducts, microscopic ducts that join like tree, branches of a tree or bunches of grapes. They join bigger and bigger and progressively larger ducts. And here only the first and second divisions are shown, but basically this goes out all into microscopic segments with literally millions of these ducts giving the pancreatic juice access to the intestine. We'll go over those in great detail. The next um, portion we need to look at would be the innervation of this system. Its major nerve supply is going to be parasympathetic. 
And in this case, it's our friend, the vagus nerve, which we're going to see over and over again, cranial nerve number 10. And in this case, again, this parasympathetic stimulation is upregulatory, excitatory, not inhibitory. All the stimulation pushes in uh, signals that upregulate the secretion with the activation of pancreatic juices for digestion. Sympathetic system, on the other hand, will do exactly the opposite and inhibit everything um, that has to do with pancreatic secretion. That's the pancreas in a nutshell, and we are gonna come back to the actual physiology of the pancreatic enzymes and juices that are involved when we talk about the physiology. But we just have to have a look at the anatomy here, especially its relationship to the biliary tree. Now, moving on to the liver, the biliary tree is um, very complicated and an enormous part of the bulk of the body. If we look at the first slide, we get a couple of relationships here. Now, this one again shows us the previous slide and shows us the duodenum. Here, the duct, the bile duct, is correctly shown behind the duodenum, and then it is shown as if we look through the liver and into the, the liver substance up here and just behind this lobe of the liver. Look at the size of the liver. It's an enormous organ. It's actually, um, if you go by weight, the liver is the largest organ of the body other than the skin and muscles, the largest functioning solitary organ. Anything referring to the liver begins with HEP. We call it HEPAR, the biggest gland of the body. Inflammation is hepatitis. We have hepatic cancers, and we have hepatic ducts. Anything in the liver begins with HEP. It has multiple, multiple functions. It's one of the most varied organs we have, and certainly the most vital. Um, it has a function of digestive enzymes. Again, we're going to see more uh, of the digestive juices brought into the duodenum from the liver. It is a place of hematopoiesis, meaning the production of blood cells. Blood cells are made in part in the liver. It is a major organ of detoxification of foreign substances that come into the body. It is a place where immune response cells are made, and it synthesizes many, many um, chemicals and substances that we use for a whole wide array of processes that I'm going to talk to you about one by one. The gross anatomy of the liver is that it occupies almost the entire upper right quadrant of the body. You can see from its shape it tucks up under the diaphragm and its mass is more to the right. It actually sits in a position so that it aligns itself just with the bottom of the rib margin, which is not shown here. And technically, if you can feel the edge of the liver under your ribs, the liver is enlarged. Now, that's not always the case. There are anatomic variations. But when the doctor examines you and has you take a deep breath while he, he or she pushes the fingers under the rib, they're trying to feel the liver edge come down and touch your fingers. If it just barely comes out from underneath the rib cage, it's probably okay. But if it's actually resting well down below the rib cage, it's enlarged. Why is that so? The body has protected this organ because it's so vital. It is protected here by the ribs, here by the ribs, and in the back by all the muscles of the lower ribs and the huge muscles of the back. We don't want to expose this. And you can see from looking at our model how it went up and back behind its own substance, it tapers, this edge here is very thin, and it has a huge right lobe and a rather small left lobe which actually crosses the midline about here. This would be the midline of the body. So most of the liver is to the right. It has minor lobes, there's the left hepatic lobe on this side, the big right lobe, and then it has minor lobes. If we flip this liver up, we are now looking at the liver from the bottom with the patient actually lying on his stomach. Here's the patient's back. Here's the patient's abdomen in front. 
And we can see that there are other lobes back here. There's a caudate, which means a tail lobe, and it actually has four lobes. And look at the peritoneal reflections. This is actually dividing and then spreading out over the liver surface. An important one is the falciform ligament, and in it is a something called the round ligament, and this is the remnants of the connections with the umbilical cord that go down through your anterior abdomen and come out your belly button, and that went to your mother. And after birth, that dried up, and it, what remains here is a ligament. If you cut that ligament and look carefully under a microscope, you would see the collapsed remnants of the umbilical vessels. They happen to go through the liver. What's also interesting back here is how doctors have fooled themselves for such a long time about this. There is a ligament that goes on top of the liver that holds it to the diaphragm and helps keep its support. So as, the, as you put your hand, I can't get in here because this model does not have a separation from the diaphragm, but if I could get my hand up over the liver, which I can in surgery, and reach up into the back, I will find a ligament that holds the liver to the diaphragm and suspends it. So I can put my hand on this diagram right up over the top and reach in and look for that ligament. That suspensory ligament that holds it to the diaphragm we have always described as being on top of the liver. It's important because there are abscesses and infections that form in these different spaces and we have to approach them surgically through the most expeditious way. Now, surgeons for centuries have said it's on top. Nobody really thought about the evolution of this until a doctor from Boston about three decades ago said, wait a minute, guys, this is the emperor's new clothes. You're all saying it's on top because we stand upright. But we evolved from animals that walked on all fours. And if you put your hand up there and measure it, it's actually attaching to the back of the diaphragm, where the diaphragm comes down parallel to the back. And that's very logical, because that's where it would have been suspended. And because there's not any evolutionary survival pressure, because this, this organ is not going to fall out, there's been no survival of the fittest pressure for it to move upward for the upright animal. And that ligament is actually still there. They called that the Emperor's New Clothes um, uh, article on the anatomy of the liver, and it changed only 30 years ago. It's really amazing how long we've believed what we wanted to believe. The blood supply to the liver is, um, comes in, here's the original drawing I showed you with this trunk coming off the aorta. This is the first branch of the aorta as it comes into the abdomen. And this right branch that comes off here that supplies the stomach goes on as the hepatic artery. It's a branch of the celiac trunk. It serves both uh, the right and left lobes of the liver, but the arterial supply to the liver um, is not something that gets our attention. The right branch of the artery then divides and serves one branch to each, the right and left lobes, and there's a lot of variation. We get into problems in this surgically because this is an area of great variation, and there are branches that go to the gallbladder, which we take in operations and we remove the gallbladder, and sometimes what will happen is the branch that goes to the right lobe um, looks like the one that's going to the gallbladder. And if you're not careful, you can take the blood supply to the right lobe, which can be serious. Um, the more important drainage is the venous drainage of the liver, and we alluded to that earlier in our course, and we're going to need to look at it in great detail here. This is a diagram you've seen before. Remember, the liver is a very important structure in terms of gathering all the nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract that have been absorbed, both toxic and beneficial. So some variation has had to be um, established over evolution to make this even more efficient than it was. So the systemic drainage from the lower half of the body, as we've seen before, meaning the muscles, the legs, other organs, 
come back and all meet in the inferior vena cava, which we've seen, and is only indicated here. It is not shown in the rest of the body for clarity. But basically, if you remember, it's coming from mostly muscles and other organs of non-digestive nature. And they all come up through the inferior vena cava, which sails right through the liver almost like a tunnel. If you look back at uh, the, this slide, here it is going through the back end of the liver. There aren't many connections with the liver uh, compared to the size of this organ. So there's another circulation called the portal circulation or the hepatic portal circulation. Now what happens here is that the blood that drains every single intestinal organ from the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine, all drain back through various roots and end up in something called the hepatic portal vein, which is right here. You can also see that the spleen drains its blood supply back into the portal vein, and it joins with the superior mesenteric vein. All these veins bring their blood back to the portal vein, and then the portal vein goes into the liver. Now this vein, as most veins, should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and returning to the heart the way the vena cava does, but it doesn't. What happens is, it, as it enters the liver, immediately after entering, it starts to break down into smaller and smaller and smaller veins again, into venules, then capillaries, and now we have venous capillaries inside the liver, those venous capillaries are going to interact with the lever, liver cells and they're going to join with other venous capillaries on the other side and then they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, they're going to connect with, through the hepatic veins right here, shown as one vein, into the vena cava and finally join the blood that's going back to the heart with the rest of the body. Now, all the physiology and pathology of the liver depends on this circulation. The portal veins drain from, as I said, inferior and superior mesenteric vein. They go back in through the liver, and the microscopic anatomy is that they will join with the arterial blood supply and mix and then bathe the liver cells. Here's what happens. This is a microscopic uh, diagram of what goes on in the liver. We have this area here, which is a group of liver cells. Blood flow coming back, you have in red the hepatic artery blood flow, which brings oxygen and nutrients, as sugar, protein, everything it brings to the rest of the body is coming back through the liver. And you also have the hepatic portal circulation coming back through the liver and paralleling the arterial circulation. Now what happens here, there are swellings in this anatomy and this swelling is called a sinusoid, something like a sinus, something like sinuses in the rest of the body. And look how they join up with the arterial side. At a microscopic level, here's arterial blood, here's the venous blood from the portal circulation, and they're joining, and of course they're getting to be within one cell's distance from the hepatocytes, the liver cells. Look also right here between the liver cells, something called a bile canaliculus, that's a little canal. The liver secretes bile, a digestive juice, and those are going in the opposite direction. Those bile that's produced by those very busy liver cells are going to drain into the canal, go out of the body, and go back into the hepatic ducts, those two big ducts I showed you coming out of the right and left side of the liver. We'll get to those in a minute. Let's go back to the circulation. Portal venous blood is actually very rich in nutrients, unlike the blood that comes out of the veins of the rest of the body where the nutrients have been depleted. The portal venous blood has picked up all those digestive 
products that the small intestine has broken down. And since it's coming from the intestines, by and large, that 28 feet of small intestine, it's going to be loaded with protein molecules and fat molecules, sugars, everything we have now gotten into the bloodstream by the enzymatic breakdown of the digestive chyme. We bring it into the portal circulation and also it happens to carry a lot of oxygen too. There's not as much depletion as there is, for example, in your skeletal muscle, your heart, or your brain. So blood leaving those organs are very depleted in oxygen. Portal circulation is not. It's a significant supply of oxygen to the hepatocytes. These join and the the sinusoids combine the blood right next to the cells, so the liver now has free exchange. It can get nutrients that it needs for building blocks. It can take out toxic elements, such as alcohol, combine it with um, the alcohol dehydrogenase, break it down, and spit it back into this venous circulation. And it can also put anything in or out of the circulation at this point that it wants to do. They then join in the, what are called central veins. See these, um, these blocks, they're little units that are microscopic, and they each have a central vein. They then join that, that hepatic vein, which goes into the vena cava on each side from the different lobes, and joins the circulation back to the heart. The blood returning to the heart from the lower body through the systemic circulation in the vena cava is not altered in any way. Only the blood coming back from the liver is altered. Now, this is very important, and I want you to look at what happens here in the liver. There's intimate contact and proximity of all the hepatic elements with every single piece of blood supply. You can imagine that it would be very easy to cause obstruction in this area. And we're going to come back to that later, but I want you to have this in mind when we look at the proximity of the hepatic cells to all the vessels coming in from the portal circulation. Let's leave that for a moment. We're going to get back to this in detail in the physiology. And we need to take a look now at the gallbladder and what's called the biliary tree. If we go back and look at this slide we have a reasonable representation of what this looks like. The gallbladder is an outpouching of an outpouching. If you think of the liver and the bile ducts as a side outpouching that evolved into this big organ and its ducts, then the gallbladder is an outpouching that has come from the duct itself. It's a, a secondary outpouching. It lives under the liver. You actually can't see it um, in normal anatomy. When you look at the liver from the front, when you operate on a person and take a look at the liver, this is what you see. You just see the fundus, the large top of the gallbladder, sticking out under the edge of the liver and sometimes don't even see that. The rest of it's hidden underneath, covered in visceral peritoneum, and then joins the bile duct there. Now, if we take a close look at the gross structure of the bile ducts. We tend, in general, to have a right and left main hepatic duct. These are joined by branches, and even though we, we tend to look at a tree this way with the branches going up, obviously the flow is this way. We've come from those microscopic bile canaliculi, little canals, all gathering bile from this enormous organ, and draining it down the left and here the right bile duct. Those are called hepatic ducts. When they join here at this point, until this point, they are called the common hepatic duct. Now the liver, uh, sorry, the gallbladder also has its own duct called cystic. The word cyst applies to a hollow organ that has fluid in it, so this is the cholecyst the bile cyst or the gallbladder. Your bladder is all, urinary bladder is also referred to as something cystic. The gallbladder has its own duct called the cystic duct. So when the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct join, everything distally 
is the common bile duct. Sometimes these words are used a little loosely and they actually are rather important to surgeons and radiologists who mark them. So we have the hepatic duct, the common hepatic duct, the common bile duct, and the cystic duct joining together. Bile comes down this duct and can drip continuously into the duodenum on a, on a slow, steady rate to help digestion. It digests primarily by emulsifying fats. Now, as a way of helping out, when the sphincter is closed here, when there's no need for bile to go into the uh, duodenum through the ampulla, then the, the bile can instead back up and go into the cystic duct and get into the gallbladder by itself and just sit there until it's needed. The gallbladder has the ability to contract and squeeze if I give you a fatty meal, quote a fatty meal, or as we might do in an x-ray situation, actually just give you some mineral oil to drink, which is a big load of fat. Very shortly after eating that fatty meal, the gallbladder will contract and try to empty itself. The problem is it's a vestigial organ. It's an organ we really don't need and it doesn't function very well. The gallbladder therefore usually doesn't empty completely. And organs in the body that don't empty completely usually get into trouble. The appendix is one of those, we'll talk about that later. The gallbladder is another. Bile has dissolved salts in it, it has cholesterol in it, and it has lots of other chemicals that are very prone to precipitate, which means to come from the solid, uh, sorry, from a liquid dissolved state to a solid. So what can happen with the bile sitting here and not emptying a lot is the bile can precipitate and it can form stones, which can be made of calcium, which can be made of cholesterol. These are rocks, real rocks that you can look at, and they can cause inflammation and infection in this area. And this is one of the most commonly um, encountered diseases in America, as well as one of the most common operations performed, and that's removal of the gallbladder. Now, going further on down the bile duct, we might look at the ampulla of Vater, which is right here. And this is a structure which also can be involved in certain diseases, uh, certain problems. One of them is cancer of the pancreas. We have looked at the pancreas, and we've looked at the bile ducts together, but cancers of the pancreas tend to be very difficult to diagnose. They're very aggressive. We have almost no idea of what causes them, so we don't know how to prevent them. We can prevent, as I've told you, almost all cancers of the lung by, by discontinuing smoking, but we don't know how to prevent cancer of the pancreas. And it is one of the few cancers that's even worse than lung cancer. The overall five-year survival for can pancreatic cancer taking all comers is about 2%. The operation to cure this disease it can, in some circumstances, have as high as a 20 to 40% mortality, meaning almost half the patients may die from the operation itself, in exchange for which we'll only get a 2% cure rate. Problems with pancreatic cancer are these. They can obstruct the bile duct. The patient will then have a backup of bile because of this common channel. Here's a nice big blow up of that. Here's the duct of Wiersung, which comes out of the pancreas. Here's the common bile duct coming down. Here's the ampulla of Vater that I told you about. And if, if the pancreas, let's say our tumor is out here and it gets big and obstructs these ducts, or if it's even little and just obstructs here. And there are pancreatic cancers actually that occur right in the ampulla. You can back the bile up and the bile will go back into the liver, reversing the normal pressure. The bile will then go back out of the liver and into the blood, not the other way, and then from the blood into the tissues, and you have what we call jaundice, which means a yellow patient. Patient skin turns yellow. Actually, the first place that turns yellow is the conjunctiva of the eyes. We call it scleral icterus, meaning yellow sclera. But that icterus is not in the sclera, it's actually in the conjunctiva that covers the white. You see yellow in the eyes first, 
then in the skin, and at a certain level, the patient can actually turn orange. It's very disturbing. It's not just a cosmetic problem because the bile salts that are in the skin itch. They are, they are crystals, and they make these patients itch, and actually, other than the pain of the cancer itself, which can be very painful, the terrible, uncontrolling itching of the entire body makes this a nightmare for patients. What can we do for this? Look at the anatomy again. I might add that we find that most pancreatic cancers occur right here in the head of the pancreas, so they tend to form symptoms that are related to backup of bile, or as you could imagine, if it got big enough, obstruction of the duodenum. It might press in here, and what would happen? The patient's food would back up and they would vomit. Tumors of the body of the pancreas and the tail of the pancreas cause no symptoms until very, very late. In all the world's literature, for all the years we've been studying this, there are about five survivors of cancers of the tail and body of the pancreas. They are patients who have been discovered completely by accident. Early in the disease, they've had an operation or an x-ray for something else that had no relation and somebody accidentally discovered an early cancer. But of the millions and millions of patients who have gotten these over the years, there's only five who've survived that. What can we do for these patients? Well, chemotherapy doesn't work very well. Radiation doesn't work very well. And I've told you about the surgery. Uh, the surgery involves removing the entire pancreas, the duodenum, the bile ducts, half the stomach, then hooking the intestine here back into the bile ducts, hooking the side of the stomach back into the intestine and removing the pancreas, which is a very difficult procedure. It's called the Whipple procedure and it is the biggest operation there is in general surgery. It requires great skill and training, should not be done by people who don't know how to do this operation. It can take them six to 14 hours to perform. And as I mentioned again, and I might remind you, we have a 2% cure rate. With great morbidity, if the patient doesn't die, they have leak of pancreatic enzymes, we have made them diabetic because we've taken out all their insulin secreting cells. So they are very brittle diabetics. Um, they have a really rough time with this. What we can do is make life a little bit better. These bile ducts up here are very dilated when they get obstruction. We can take a piece of intestine and bring it up and sew it to the bile ducts. So at least the itching will go away. They'll get drainage again and we can get rid of that for them, but it requires an operation. There's another technique called percutaneous, which means through the skin, transhepatic, through the liver, um, insertion of a catheter. A radiologist can stand on the outside of the patient and through a needle, go through the abdominal wall and put a needle blindly with suction through the liver. He is or she is very likely to strike a bile duct because they're dilated. In a normal patient, you'd be very unlikely to hit that bile duct on the first try, but they can keep sucking until green comes back into the syringe and then using a guide wire and then a flexible catheter, place a semi-permanent catheter into that duct and attach it permanently to the outside of the skin, drain it, the bile into a bag. And since almost all these ducts connect way down here, that will effectively decompress the liver. So that's a step less aggressive and a way to treat these pancreatic cancer patients. The other thing we can do is we can stop their vomiting because we can hook this portion of the intestine up to the stomach and bypass this portion of their obstruction and at least they'll stop vomiting. They're not going to increase their life. This is what we call palliative surgery. In this case, it's good palliative surgery. We've managed to take a patient who's really miserable, who has jaundice and vomiting and is wasting away um, and at least make what time they have a little better and a little more comfortable. The real problem with this cancer is, is that it's in the retroperitoneum. It's in and near the back, and it tends to invade straight back, and that's where all our nerves are coming together. It's a very highly innervated place, and sooner or later these patients get intractable pain, pain we cannot control short of cutting segments in the cord, which is a big thing to do. They get on very high doses of narcotics, uh, which may take the edge off the pain and eventually 
probably speed up, not the demise of the patient. Um, it's an area that needs a lot more research. We need to find out what causes this cancer and do something more than what we're able to do now. That's the anatomy of the pancreas, the liver, and the biliary tree. Next time we'll look at some of the fascinating physiology that goes along with this.